All right. The cranial cavity is divided into three fossae. The anterior cranial fossa is separated from the middle by the lesser wings of the sphenoid. And the middle cranial fossa is separated from the posterior one by the petrous part of the temporal bone. In the anterior cranial fossa, in the middle, there is this upward projection, which is part of the ethmoid bone, which is called the crista galli. This gives attachment to the fox cerebri, a part of the meninges, or one of the layers of the meninges. In front of the crista galli, there is the foramen cecum. This is only a variation, which is found in about 1% of the population. And if it is present, it transmits an emissary vein from the nasal mucosa to the superior sagittal sinus. On the sides of the crista galli, there is the cribriform plate, which is again part of the ethmoid bone. This cribriform plate has many perforations or foramina, which are called the cribriform foramina or the olfactory foramina, and they transmit the olfactory nerves, which gives the sense of smell, and it's the first cranial nerve. In the middle cranial fossa, first, we have in the center the body of the sphenoid. It contains or has many features. First of all, there are these two projections which come from the anterior cranial fossa, from the lesser wings of the sphenoid, and they are called the anterior clinoid processes. These give attachment to the tentorium cerebelli. Just posterior to them, there is this projection which is called the tuberculum celli. The tuberculum celli ends at both sides at the middle clinoid processes. These are sometimes evident as the middle clinoid processes. Behind that, there is the dorsum celli. The dorsum celli gives the posterior clinoid processes, which again gives attachment to the tentorium cerebelli. Between the tuberculum celli and the dorsum celli, there is this fossa, which is called the hypophysial fossa, or the pituitary fossa, or the cella turcica. This lodges the pituitary gland, or the hypophysis cerebri. In front of the tuberculum celli, there is a small or a tiny sulcus. This is, for the, this is called the sulcus chiasmatis, or the chiasmatic sulcus, and it lodges the uh, optic chiasm. The union of the two optic nerves forms the optic chiasm, and it sits right in the chiasmatic sulcus. The dorsum celli then uh, ends or goes down to the foramen magnum. This line is called the clevis. From the dorsum celli to the foramen magnum, this is called the clevis. Okay, if we go lateral to the optic chiasm, we will see the optic canal. On the anterior aspect, this is the optic canal. And on the cranial aspect, this is where it lies. Okay, this is the, anti the optic canal. What structures pass through the optic canal? We have the optic nerve, the ophthalmic artery, and the central artery and vein of the retina. The most important one is the optic nerve, then the ophthalmic artery, then the central artery and vein of the retina. From both optic canals, the optic nerves come and unite to form the optic chiasm here. So it is very easy. It just leads into the optic canal. Then, lateral to the optic canal, there is the superior orbital fissure. This is the superior orbital fissure. And on the anterior aspect, this is the orbital, the superior orbital fissure. It is somewhat oblique and vertical. What structures pass through this fissure? We have about seven structures. Three separate cranial nerves, which are the oculomotor, which is the third cranial nerve, the trochlear, which is the fourth cranial nerve, and the abducens, which is the sixth cranial nerve. Then we have the first division of the fifth cranial nerve, that is, the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, which gives three branches. These three branches are the frontal, which supplies this area, the nasociliary, and the lacrimal. It gives three branches. The other structure that passes through the superior orbital fissure is the superior ophthalmic vein. Besides those, we also have the sympathetic fibers, but these are not important to mention. The, uh, just behind the superior orbital fissure, there is the foramen rotundum.
This is found in the floor of the middle cranial fossa. The foramen rotundum transmits only one structure, which is the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve, and it leads into the pterygopalatine fossa. You can see the needle here. That is the pterygopalatine fossa. This is where the foramen rotundum leads to. It's visible? Okay. So we said the foramen rotundum transmits the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve. Just behind the foramen rotundum, there is the foramen ovale. It is oval shaped, and this one is round shaped. The foramen ovale transmits three structures, the most important of which is the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. On the inferior aspect, the foramen ovale would be this. This is the foramen ovale. It transmits, the most important one is the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. Then there comes the lesser petrosal nerve, then the accessory meningeal artery. It transmits those three structures. Then behind the foramen ovale, we have the foramen spinosum. This is the foramen spinosum. The foramen spinosum transmits which structure? It is the middle meningeal vessels, that is, the middle meningeal artery and vein, as well as the meningeal branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. The most important structure is the middle meningeal vessels. As an additional part, we also have the meningeal branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. Medial to these three foramina, we have the foramen lacerum. This is the foramen lacerum. And right behind it, there is the carotid canal. So they are connected to one another. In life, the foramen lacerum is closed. From the inferior aspect, this is the foramen lacerum. We can prove it like this. It goes to the foramen lacerum. This is on the inner aspect. And on the outer aspect, this is the foramen lacerum. Okay. In real life, on the inferior aspect, the foramen lacerum is closed. And the optic canal, which on the inferior aspect is seen. Okay, if we can. Alright. This is the carotid canal. It can't pass through it. Okay, this is the carotid canal on the inferior aspect, and this is the foramen lacerum. In real life, on the inferior aspect, this is closed. So the ca internal carotid artery passes through the carotid canal, and it emerges. We take it like this. It emerges on the inner aspect. It's not very visible. Okay, this is it. This is the carotid canal. Okay. You can take it. All right. This is how the, the internal carotid artery goes. If we can uh, put it there. Okay. So this is the inner opening of the carotid canal. And on the inferior aspect, we have the outer opening of the carotid canal. This is the carotid canal. So in real life, on the inner aspect, this upper part is closed. This upper part is closed. That is the internal carotid artery enters the cranium or the cranial cavity through the carotid canal and it emerges from this upper part above the foramen lacerum. So it has a posterolateral course if you take it like this. This is how it goes in the internal carotid artery. The main structures passing through this canal are the internal carotid artery with its accompanying sympathetic and venous plexuses. It is not alone. It has the venous and the sympathetic plexuses with it. But another important structure is the greater petrosal nerve. Through the foramen lacerum, we have the greater petrosal nerve and the deep petrosal nerve. These two structures join to form the nerve of the pterygoid canal. Now, the pterygoid canal is not visible here. It is, uh, in real life, located somewhere around here. Where does this pterygoid, you know, what does it contain? It contains the nerve of the pterygoid canal, which is also called the vidian nerve. But as we said, it is not visible on the specimen. Maybe it's located here, if you can uh, point to it. But the most important structure is the internal carotid artery passing through the carotid canal into the cranium. Then, 
the other structures, that's all, you know, about it all in the middle cranial fossa. We come to the posterior cranial fossa. The first opening to notice is the internal acoustic meatus. This is the internal acoustic meatus. It contains or uh, three structures pass through it. These are the vestibulocochlear and the facial nerves. The vestibulocochlear, which is the eighth cranial nerve, and the facial nerve, which is the seventh cranial nerve, pass through this foramen or opening. Another structure also passes through it, which is the labyrinthine artery. As the name implies, it goes to the labyrinth of the inner ear. Then we have the jugular foramen. This is the jugular foramen. It is irregular and it's large. A number of structures pass through this jugular foramen. Three cranial nerves, which are the ninth, tenth, and eleventh. These are the glossopharyngeal, the vagus, and the accessory nerves. These three cranial nerves pass through the jugular foramen. As for the veins, we have from the cranium the inferior petrosal sinus. This is the groove for the inferior petrosal sinus. It leads into the jugular foramen, and that's where it goes. The other one is the sigmoid sinus. The sigmoid sinus, going like this, this is the massive group of the uh, sigmoid sinus. It leads into the jugular foramen. So the structure about this sigmoid sinus, here it ends. The sigmoid sinus, the name changes. It ends into the internal jugular vein. Okay, so you can say that the, of the structures that pass through this foramen, the end of the sigmoid sinus or the sigmoid sinus becoming the internal jugular vein. And the two other small insignificant arteries that pass through it are the meningeal branches of the ascending pharyngeal and occipital arteries. But that's not very important. The most important are the three cranial nerves, the inferior petrosal sinus, and the sigmoid sinus becoming the internal jugular vein. Then we have this foramen magnum. The foramen magnum has many structures passing through it. The uh, most important is the end of the brain stem. That is the end of the medulla or the beginning of the spinal cord. This is where the spinal cord goes. Other structures passing through it are the spinal roots of the accessory nerve or the, uh, the ascending spinal roots of the accessory nerve. We said the accessory nerve is the 11th cranial nerve. Okay, this, the ascending spinal roots of the accessory nerve pass through the foramen magnum. Other structures include the meninges, they also pass through this uh, area. We have the right and left vertebral arteries. We have the anterior and posterior spinal arteries. We have the dural veins and we have the venous plexus of the spinal canal. All these structures pass through the foramen magnum. Okay. Then we have the uh, structure. Okay, wait a sec. This is more visible on the outside. This structure here. Okay. This is the hypoglossal canal. Okay. The hypoglossal canal. So on the inner aspect, it is not very visible. You can you can see it from the inner aspect. This is the hypoglossal canal on the lowermost aspect. It is located below the occipital condyles. It transmits two structures. The most important one is the hypoglossal nerve, which is the 12th cranial nerve. The other one is the meningeal branch of the ascending pharyngeal artery. Okay. Now, other than these structures, there are some uh, variable foramina which are found in the skull. These are not found in all, all uh, skull uh, specimens, but they are found in, you can say, some of them or most of them. One of those is the condylar canal. It's also called the condyloid foramen. This is the condylar canal. And you can see it on the outer aspect, or if we can bring it from the inferior aspect. This is the condylar canal. Okay? And now if you take a look at the interior aspect, this is the condylar canal. What structure passes through this? It is called the condylar emissary vein. It is a vein from the sigmoid sinus to the vertebral veins of the neck. Okay. Another structure, another foramen that is found is the mastoid foramen. 
this is the mastoid foramen. It, it doesn't have an internal part. This is the mastoid foramen. Uh, if it exists, uh, there is the mastoid emissary vein from the sigmoid sinus, as well as the meningeal branch of the occipital artery to the dura mater. These two structures pass through the mastoid foramen. Okay. Then we come to the inferior aspect of the skull. The inferior aspect of the skull contains a number of other foramina. Most of these foramina we've already seen. They are continuations of the foramina from the cranial cavity. This is the foramen ovale, the foramen spinosum, the carotid canal, the foramen lacerum. Okay. This is the jugular foramen. This is the hypoglossal canal on the outer aspect. This is the hy hypoglossal canal. And uh, this is basically what we have seen from the inner aspect. Now, the foramina, which are found on the inferior part or inferior view of the skull but are not found in the cranial cavity, include the following. First, we have this structure here. Now, if you collect between the different, you know, the kinds of information given, we come to a conclusion. This is called the, for the incisive fossa. Itself, it is the incisive fossa. In its walls, there are the incisive foramina. These incisive foramina lead to incisive canals. Okay, so itself, it is the incisive fossa. In the walls, there are incisive foramina which lead to incisive canals. What structures pass through it? We have the nasopalatine nerve and the terminal part of the greater palatine or the sphenopalatine vessels. These structures pass through these foramina. If we come a little bit down, we have the two palatine foramina, the greater and the lesser. The lesser is often two, but it's you know sometimes just one foramen. The greater palatine foramen and the lesser palatine foramen these transmit the greater and lesser palatine nerves and vessels. It goes with their name. The greater and lesser palatine foramina transmit the greater and lesser palatine nerves and vessels. Okay. Now, there are some structures which are mentioned theoretically, but they are not visible here. For example, the sphenopalatine foramen. The sphenopalatine foramen is supposed to be located somewhere here. It has to be somewhere around here, the sphenopalatine foramen. This establishes a connection between the nasal cavity and the pterygomaxillary or the pterygopalatine fossa. The pterygopalatine fossa has many connections. We mentioned that on the cranial aspect, in the cranial cavity, it is connected to the foramen rotundum. We said that it leads to the uh, the pterygopalatine fossa. Okay, its connection with the nasal cavity is th through this sphenopalatine foramen, which is supposed to be somewhere around here. The sphenopalatine foramen. What does it transmit? It transmits the nasopalatine nerve and the sphenopalatine vessels. Just like the incisive foramen, the sphenopalatine foramen transmits the same structures. The nasopalatine nerve and the sphenopalatine vessels. Another structure that is not really seen is the palatine canal. The palatine canal is where, it's somewhere around here in this aspect, it is where the palatine vessels and nerves descend, descend into this area. They come from the upper aspect, they descend through the palatine canal into the mouth, into the, the, the nose and the mouth, into this area. Another structure. Here we have the stylomastoid foramen. This is visible. The stylomastoid foramen transmits what? It transmits the facial nerve. Stylomastoid foramen transmits the facial nerve. Now on the inner aspect, on the cranial aspect, or the, uh, the, in the cranial cavity, we said that the facial nerve is transmitted through the internal acoustic meatus, along with the vestibulocochlear nerve and the laboring thin artery. But after it passes through the ear, it comes out through the stylomastoid foramen. It's located between the styloid process and the mastoid process of the temporal bone, and that's why it's called the stylomastoid foramen. 
Now the other structure. Well, and okay, there is the. We mentioned the pterygoid canal uh, previously. We said that it transmits the uh, nerve of the pterygoid canal or the vidian nerve. Now you can say that it is somewhere here. This is where the pterygoid canal is, somewhere around here. Not exactly that, but somewhere located around here. Okay, this is, uh, and uh, of course, uh, we know this is the mandibular fossa, the, and above uh, or anterior to it, there is an articular tubercle. By both structures, they form the articular surface for the temporomandibular joint, or the condylar part of the mandible. Now if we come to the venous sinuses of the brain, or in the cranial cavity, we're not mentioning the sinuses themselves, just the grooves which they form. Now, uh, they are mostly visible on the posterior aspect. We already mentioned this, uh, the inferior petrosal sinus. This is the groove for the inferior petrosal sinus. Okay. This is the one for the superior petrosal sinus. Okay. And on the uh, posterior aspect, this is for the transverse sinus, the grooves for the transverse sinus. And this is for the sigmoid sinus. You can see that it leads into the jugular foramen.